the Iowa-class battleships occupy a unique place in American naval history. Conceived in the late 1930s, these ships were designed to combine firepower, speed, and heavy armor. Ordered in 1939 and built throughout the early 1940s, the four completed vessels, the Iowa, New Jersey, Missouri, and Wisconsin, were part of a larger class initially intended to include Illinois and Kentucky. Their construction coincided with a period of intense global conflict, as the United States prepared for the possibility of war in both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters. At the time, dreadnought battleships were still considered the ultimate expression of naval power. The Iowa class was designed with the capability to escort fast carrier task forces, combining heavy armor protection with high speed. Each ship incorporated the all-or-nothing armor scheme, optimized to provide a zone of immunity against the 14 to 16 inch guns prevalent in contemporary navies. The Citadel, housing magazines and propulsion machinery, was protected by a combination of face-hardened and homogeneous armor, with specialized high tensile structural steel supplementing the protection. Main battery turrets were fortified with armor exceeding 19 inches in thickness on the face, while the conning towers were similarly heavily shielded. Torpedo defense systems built into the hull utilized internal bulges, multiple longitudinal bulkheads, and water-loaded compartments to mitigate underwater explosions. These designs reflected the lessons learned from both the South Dakota class and extensive pre-war testing, resulting in a class that's balanced survivability, speed, and firepower. By the time the Iowas entered service, however, the era of the battleship as the dominant capital ship was already passing. Aircraft carriers had demonstrated their capacity to project power at unprecedented ranges, particularly in the Pacific theater. The Iowa-class battleships were therefore initially deployed primarily as carrier escorts, providing anti-aircraft screening for the fast carrier task forces and offering shore bombardments during amphibious operations. Each ship saw significant action in the final stages of World War II. Iowa and New Jersey participated in campaigns in the Marshall Islands and Marianas, while the Missouri gained historical prominence as the site of Japan's formal surrender. Wisconsin, in turn, provided naval gunfire support during the Philippines and Okinawa campaigns. All four were decommissioned or placed in reserve following the end of hostilities, as the rapid ascendance of air power rendered their traditional roles increasingly marginal. The post-war period saw intermittent reactivations driven by the outbreak of the Korean War and later by operations during the Vietnam conflict. The Korean War in particular demonstrated that, despite their age, these battleships retain utility in providing naval gunfire support, delivering heavy shells with precision against shore targets and enemy positions. However, technological evolution, particularly in jet aircraft and missile developments, gradually rendered their 20 and 40 mm anti-aircraft batteries obsolete. Subsequent deactivations followed each operational cycle, with the last decommissioning prior to the 1980s modernization occurring in the late 1950s or early 1960s, depending on the ship. The strategic context of the 1980s brought the Iowa class back into relevance, albeit under dramatically different circumstances. The Cold War has entered a period of intensification following the Vietnam War, and the Soviet Union had embarked on an ambitious naval build-up. The decision to reactivate the Iowa-class battleships in the 1980s was closely linked to the commissioning of the Soviet Kirov-class battlecruisers. 
nuclear-powered surface combatants that's represented a significant increase in Soviet naval striking power. The commissioning of the Kirov class, displacing over 28,000 tons, marked a clear expansion of Soviet surface capability. U.S. naval planners viewed the Kirov's combination of speed, long-range missiles, and heavy anti-ship armaments as a potential threat to carrier task forces and to NATO maritime dominance. In this context, the Iowas were seen as a cost-effective means to rapidly bolster surface firepower, providing a highly visible show of strength while supplementing carrier and destroyer groups. Their survivability, armor, and long-range guns are promising for surface engagements, while the modernized missile systems allow them to participate in anti-ship and land attack missions. To the politicians in Congress, the rationale was defensible in terms of an immediate boost to U.S. naval power, in terms of raw displacement and firepower, and signaling U.S. resolve. However, in practical terms, the AOWA's utility against the Kirov task force was very limited. Modern anti-ship missiles, electronic warfare systems, and submarine threats means that even a heavily armed battleship would have faced significant vulnerability in a high-intensity naval engagement, making the choice more symbolic than of tangible military value at least in the context of direct encounters with the Kirov. Furthermore, President Ronald Reagan's 600-ship Navy initiative sought to expand and modernize the fleet. The reactivation of older platforms like the Aowa-class battleships obviously helps to achieve that goal. Their speed, which had been a design requirement to allow them to keep pace with fast carrier task forces, made them qualify to escort the fast nuclear-powered supercarriers. Reactivating the AOWAS required extensive modernization, reflecting both the changes in naval warfare since World War II and the obsolescence of certain systems. The most significant upgrades addressed firepower, sensors, and defensive systems. While the 16-inch guns remained the central component of the offensive capability, new missile systems were added to extend their reach and versatility. Armored box launchers were installed to carry Tomahawk land attack missiles, providing the battleships with a precision strike capability against targets at ranges exceeding a thousand kilometers. Complementing these were quad sail launchers for harpoon anti-ship missiles, giving the ships the ability to engage enemy surface combatants beyond the horizon. Harpoons, of course, don't have anywhere near the range of the Tomahawks. The integration of these missile systems necessitated corresponding upgrades in radar, fire control, and communications to ensure effective targeting capabilities. SWG-1 fire control system was introduced for the fire control of harpoon missiles, and the SWG-2 and 3 systems were introduced to fire control the Tomahawk missiles. The AN-SLQ-32 electronic warfare system was added to detect, jam, and deceive enemy radar, while electronic countermeasures, such as shaft decoy launchers, were added. The AN-SLQ-25 Nixie torpedo defense system further enhanced survivability in a high-threat environment full of Soviet submarines. Defensive upgrades extended to the battleship's anti-aircraft armament. The Legacy 20 and 40mm guns, rendered ineffective by the high-speed jet aircraft, were removed. In their place, four Phalanx close-in weapon systems were installed per ship, providing automated last-line defense against incoming missiles. Additionally, storage and launch positions for Stinger missiles were established, enabling the crew to engage aerial threats at closer ranges. 
These modifications reflected a broader shift in naval doctrine, emphasizing layered air defense and electronic warfare over traditional gun-based anti-aircraft fire. The battleship's aircraft capability also evolved. While initially equipped with float planes launched via catapults, by the mid-20th century, these aircraft had been replaced with helicopters for reconnaissance and spotting duties. In the 1980s, the RQ-2 Pioneer unmanned aerial vehicle was adopted, launched via rocket assist from the fantail and recovered via large nets. These UAVs provided live video feeds for targeting significantly improving the accuracy of both naval gunfire and missile strikes. During Operation Desert Storm, Missouri and Wisconsin successfully deployed the Pioneer UAVs to aid in fire support operations, demonstrating the practical value of integrating unmanned systems with naval platforms. During their reactivation in the 1980s, the Iowa-class battleships were assigned to surface action groups or battleships battle groups, operating alongside cruisers, destroyers, frigates, and support vessels. These groups were designed to provide flexible, multi threat response in both blue water and littoral environments. Missouri and Wisconsin, in particular, participated in extensive training exercises in the North Atlantic and Mediterranean, integrating with NATO forces to test command and control interoperability, missile coordination, and combined arms engagements. The ships conducted live fire drills with their Tomahawk and Harpoon missiles, refined coordinated gunfire support procedures using their main batteries, and trained crews in UAV assisted targeting. These exercises validated the ability of the AWAS to project firepower over long distances while remaining fairly capable of defending themselves against modern threats. The Gulf War of 1991 was indeed the operational highlight and the twilight of the modernized AWA class. Missouri and Wisconsin were deployed to the Persian Gulf, where they provided critical naval gunfire support against Iraqi positions along the Kuwaiti and southern Iraqi coastlines. Missouri fired 28 Tomahawk missiles and over 750 rounds from her 16-inch guns, while Wisconsin launched 24 Tomahawks and 319 16-inch shells, targeting fortifications, artillery emplacements, and troop concentrations. Their precision and sustained bombardment capability allowed coalition forces to suppress Iraqi defenses and support amphibious and ground operations. Additionally, the Pioneer UAVs were used operationally to spot fall-off shots and provide real-time intelligence, marking one of the first combat deployments of unmanned aerial systems aboard a surface combatant. These operations showcased the adaptability of the Iowa-class battleships, demonstrating that even platforms designed in the 1930s could still deliver meaningful combat effects when modernized with contemporary weaponry and sensors. The debate over the utility of the Awas in the post-Cold War era illustrates the complex balance between capability, cost, and doctrine. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, the strategic rationale for a 600-ship navy weakened, and defense budgets were reduced. The operational costs associated with the Awa-class battleships were significant, reflecting both their manpower requirements, nearly 3,500 sailors per ship, and the expense of maintaining aging gun and missile systems. The reactivation and modernization of each vessel in the 1980s had already cost approximately $1.7 billion, 
and estimates in the late 1990s suggested that returning them to operational status for the 21st century would have required half a billion dollars per ship. Additionally, the loss of institutional knowledge for operating legacy systems, such as the 16-inch guns, combined with limited spare parts and logistical challenges, further constrained the practicality of maintaining these vessels in active service. Technological developments in the intervening decades also diminished the unique advantages previously offered by the battleships. Modern destroyers and cruisers equipped with vertical launch systems could carry far more missiles than the Iowas, while smaller but more rapid-firing gun systems on the Ale Burke provided higher volumes of fire support with greater precision and without the logistical burdens associated with large battleships. The plan to equip the Zumwalt class with long-range naval artillery also rendered the range advantage of the Iowa no longer relevant, although that plan ultimately failed. These considerations, combined with the strategic shift towards smaller, more flexible naval forces, ultimately led Congress to approve the decommissioning and removal of the remaining Iowa-class battleships from the Naval Vessel Register by 2006. Despite their obsolescence in modern naval doctrine, the Iowa-class battleships remain culturally and historically significant. Their combat records from World War II to Korea, Vietnam, and the Gulf War, combined with their symbolic association with American naval power, have ensured their preservation as museum ships. The Iowa is displayed in San Pedro, California, the New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey, the Missouri at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and the Wisconsin at Nauticus in Norfolk, Virginia. Each serves as a tangible reminder of the evolution of naval warfare, the transition from gun-based battleships to carrier and missile-based warships. They also serve as a reminder of the enduring appeal of iconic dreadnoughts in both public imagination and military history. In evaluating the modernization and service of the Iowa-class battleships in the 1980s and early 1990s, several conclusions emerge. First, the reactivations demonstrated that even older platforms could be rendered operationally relevant through the integration of modern missile systems, electronic warfare, and unmanned aerial assets. Second, they underscored the continued utility of heavy naval gunfire in certain scenarios, particularly for coastal bombardments and supporting amphibious operations, where their 16-inch guns still outperformed smaller caliber weapons. Third, the operational experience highlighted the tension between cost, manpower, and technological obsolescence illustrating the broader challenges faced by navies in balancing tried-and-tested legacy capabilities with emerging systems. Finally, the cultural and historical significance of the Iowas reinforced the notion that retired capital ships contribute to heritage, morale, and public engagement. The Iowa class was designed for a world dominated by battleship engagements and nascent carrier air power, but they adapted to missile warfare during the 1980s, reflecting the demands of Cold War geopolitics and the ingenuity of naval engineering. However, with the renewed focus of the US Navy on blue water capabilities and naval warfare of the high seas, we can say with confidence that the age of the battleship is finally over.